Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me, Representative Blackwell and the, and the committee. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm Claire Boris. I'm with the Foundation for Excellence in Education, or Excel in Ed, as we like to go by. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a uh, education reform and advocacy organization founded by Governor Jeb Bush um, in 2009. Uh, based on the Florida reform package um, and the demand the demand from other states to um, learn from Florida and some of the things that worked down there. Um, we, we also have built our portfolio to include a lot of uh, innovations as well. Um, you may be familiar with my colleague Brian Mahoney, who is our director of advocacy in this region. He, he may look familiar to some of you, but not on, on your doors. I hope to build on um, uh, what, what, what we talked about in some of the details of the law to, to talk about some uh, recommendations and uh, analysis that, that go with it. Um, I think to begin here, um, we talked about the background. I think the key takeaway here is that we should keep reminding ourselves about this law is that it's an interesting balance. They crafted this uh, this compromise, pretty amazing compromise, it's amazing this day in Congress if they can reach one, um, that significantly reduced the federal role in education, but at the same time did preserve some key elements of accountability. Um, and so there's going to be that tension, you know, especially around assessments and reporting. So that you'll see that tension sort of throughout uh, our discussion. Um, you know, I, I think I want to congratulate you for addressing this topic today and all already because I think there's a lot of many states that we hear from are focused only right now on compliance a lot of our questions are what do we need to do now tell me right now um, are there any deadlines what um, you know give me a list of things I need to do and we're encouraging folks to um, really step back here and take this moment to to the balls in your court the states won a lot more authority over uh, the education, their education systems. What do you want to do with it? Um, and you do have a ton more flexibility within within some parameters. Um, and, and I think in thinking about that, um, we want to think about. We encourage states to think about opportunities um, around the, the ability to recommit to rigorous accountability, um, to adopt smarter, more innovative testing policies. Um, and to direct more federal funds towards their, the priorities that are state determined. Um, at the other hand, this transition also creates a lot of risks um, uh, for states uh, in terms of capacity, in terms of political risks and threats to accountability, which we can get into as well. Um, there's also a ton of uncertainty. Um, you'll notice particularly here in red on my slide, this is our, our attempt to make the timeline as simple as possible. Um, we touched on this, but what we want folks to think about is that um, there's on there's ongoing rulemaking. Um, we think the department is the department's off and running. They're already starting uh, next month. We'll start negotiated rulemaking, and this summer we'll start to see some drafts of what the department plans to do around accountability. Um, next year. A transition year. States really don't have to do too much next year. You have to test, you have to report, but it's a little bit of a, a, a free year to really focus on planning. New requirements take effect, and most provisions in the bill, that 17 18 school year. Um, the, the thing about the department has tentatively said that they should have their new. Uh, Lou probably has, uh, Dr. Fabrizio probably has the state circled. July 1, 2017 is when the department has said states should think about having their new accountability plan in place. That's going to be the Title I plan that they send to the department that says, is this okay? <laughs> um, does this comply with the law? So it's a big date to think about. Um, and this, uh, you know, I think this is certainly not a perfect law. Um, Congress didn't do everything perfectly. Usually, that's I'm sure you're familiar with that. When a compromise comes together, it's often a little messy. One thing Congress did do, though, is allow for an 18-month transition, and we think that was smart, smart policy. Um, that's it. At the same time, it's an incredibly, incredibly trans, uh, complex time for states. Um, 
They have, many states have to continue transitioning to new assessments or make decisions about new assessments, which is always challenging. Um, they're going to have to design new accountability systems or revise accountability systems so they comply with the law. Waivers will end. Um, states have to develop strategies for new, uh, they have new flexibility of funds, so they're going to have to develop strategies around that. Um, and prepare for new options and opportunities for innovation. So that, that's, that's a lot on the to-do list of our state lawmakers, our chiefs, and our, our governors as they think about this new law. Um, this timeline also brings one important point um, that we have shared with states in, in our view, and I think the view of a lot of organizations, is don't do anything yet. It's too soon. It's too soon to rush. We need to continue your business. But in, in terms of major changes around accountability, our view is that during this legislative session, there are too, un, too many unknowns. The department has not even started showing us where they're going with rulemaking. So it's too likely that if you made a change now, you would have to change it again next year, which we know is, um, it just doesn't make sense. We recommend that you kind of just place a hold this legislative session. Uh, and that, that we do feel that's a view shared by uh, a lot of organizations. Um, I printed out the slides because this one, you know, that Lee pointed out, it's a 1,061-page bill, 40, over 40 billion in K-12 spending, um, a range of titles and programs. Um, there's a lot that changed in the law, and then, and then there's plenty that didn't. Um, this is our attempt, and I'm not gonna run through this slide, but this is our attempt at the most high level. Here we think, the things we think states care about, and whether they were eliminated, survived, or their new requirements or opportunities in the law. Um, to give an example, if the uh, eliminated, it is, um, the department is now expressly, forever and ever and ever, prohibited from interfering at all with states' decisions around standards. That's made even more explicit, um, so they can't even do anything to incent states. Um, that's actually not a huge change, because the federal government couldn't do much beforehand, um, but now it's very explicit in law. Um, and then in the survive category, some of the things uh, we talked about, about that assessments, um, and even though there's flexibility around assessments, the requirements for when you have to test are the same as annual. Um, <coughs> And, uh, uh, and and reporting has, has, has actually been enhanced. Um, and then in the new category, you'll see a lot of a lot of new flexibilities, a lot of new opportunities that we can that we can dive into. And I'm happy. I, I want to kind of give an overview and not dive into specific things, um, but happy to answer questions. Nope. I, yeah, I'm at the end, and people are probably hungry, so I know my I know my place here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is this is our this slide. Um, there are a lot of a lot of changes in the law. Um, the biggest ones were around, and the ones most meaningful for you all are, are around accountability. Um, you asked us to address where states can definitely expect greater leeway, and you can see here this is the major shift: the locus of control over accountability un, un, under NCLB. The, the former reauthorization of this law was mostly with the feds. Now it's mostly with the, all with all of states, um, with some guardrails around some particular issues. Um, the goals are pretty much totally up to the state to determine. Standards, the department cannot even look at your state. They don't, you don't even submit your standards. Um, interventions, huge area. So, a, a scary extent because I think it's the hardest thing to do. Interventions, huge. They're on the state's uh, plate, and they have total freedom. It's going to be a huge challenge for states to figure out how to how to do that well. Teacher evaluations also no longer. Um, they were not a part of No Child Left Behind. They were part of the waivers. Um, it's now totally up to the state what they do with teacher evaluations. Um, now I think in red here I highlighted. Um, school ratings this um, this is an area where we think there's going to be that there are clear requirements in the law um, we talked about and I think this is an area that the department is going to be especially under this administration most interested in focusing so um, if you want to think about a place where um, state input is most valuable it's going to be um, 
around accountability. And as, as Lee also pointed out, there's been this, the coverage of, of ESSA has been, hey guys, it's open season, states can do what they want. That's not true around an account of, around accountability in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. In particular around, there are five specific indicators that must go into your accountability system. And now it's gonna be up to the state, up to the department to decide. This is gonna be the, the real question mark about how the department decides to handle this. The US Department of Education has some authority to regulate around that. How, how strong are they gonna go? Are they going to, some options that some folks have asked for, is the department going to set specific weights or ranges, how much each indicator within your school rating system, how much it must be weighted? Um, is the department um, going to uh, really focus and set parameters around how subgroups must be included? We know subgroups must be included, that's very clear in the law. How they are included, um, and that is, is going to be um, an issue that the department could regulate on. Um, another one is around the participation requirement um, and whether, whether the department tries to push states to be pretty strict on the consequences if a school fails to meet the requirement that 95% of students participate in the exams. It's gonna be up, largely up to the state, but the department has some, may have some room there. Um, and assessments, um, as uh, Representative Corp, assessments is another issue where um, there's room for the department to regulate because it's so technical you need to. It, it says in the law, for example, that if you do something innovative around assessments, it has to be valid, reliable, comparable, and affect every kid statewide. That means there's a place for the department. The department has to define those terms and set up a process for how it's gonna determine if those requirements in the law have been met. So that's just room for the department to make them more strict, less strict, give states a little more room or not. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Sure. Well, okay. I gave you a bunch of adjectives as to what assessments must be. Yeah. But among those adjectives was not the fact that they had to be the same assessment here as it is there unless, uh, even for the same subgroup. Yeah, uh, it, do, it does have to be the same assessment with some exceptions in the law now. Um, but it, 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 nothing in this law is totally simple to answer, um, but states are gonna have some flexibility. You have to have a single statewide assessment system. That's a basic, which means kids are getting, other than the kids with the most significant cognitive issues are getting uh, the same assessment. But there are now some pilot programs where you could have a few districts do something innovative and have them take it at their steps, but it has to be comparable. Would not maybe a subjective assessments based on general, same general criteria apply? So it doesn't have to be, what I'm getting at is does it have to be a written test? Uh, under the law, it, I mean, it does not have to be, there's, there's now options for portfolio assessments, lots of different ways to test, but those tests have to meet certain requirements in the law, and nobody, and in fact, many of those options were available under No Child Left Behind, but no states have done it because it's so hard to do. It's so hard to do that kind of portfolio assessment. It is very, very expensive. Um, and very, very difficult to do accurately well, which is why states haven't had the capacity or really the desire to do it once they start looking into it. Um, some states are going that direction, like in New Hampshire, in four districts in New Hampshire, I've heard a joke, it's about 20 kids, and then New Hampshire will be the first one to say, this is so hard. They're, doing, they're moving towards competency-based, they've been doing at it for 10 years, and it's exciting what they're doing. They're moving to a different way of, um, of assessing, and they, um, they have permission from the department right now to only do a major statewide test every three years with these four districts, and they have, but it is incredibly difficult to do well in a way that's valid and fair for kids and schools and teachers and everyone has consequences. So yeah, the options are there, it's just we haven't seen, I think what the law did, their attempt was to give all these options because hopefully in 10 years we'll be able to do them. 
um, or they'll be able to do them well. We don't have, the capacity isn't there yet with um, various, um, uh, for financial reasons and just general capacity reasons to do some of these things as well as they need to be done to be valid. It's something, I, we can, I can think we have two, we have someone on staff who's our accountability person and who's our competency-based expert and they work closely together and they're trying to figure this out and help states through this um, transition. It's gonna be a, um, a long one for those who wanna do it. Um, Linda, did you wanna get in a question now while we're, no. since representing Horn did. Oh, okay. I, I was gonna say I'll give up. your guidelines, but um, for fear that I'll lose it. I just wondered if, um, and I understand that you're just now assessing the standards, and I understand it's just having uh, the, uh, the act, and I realize that you can't answer every question. But in our state, um, we're in the process of establishing our standards, and the minute the um, uh, act was passed, I had a lot of experts in my district. <laughs> well, I'm trying to clarify what I think it is, and I'm asking you what that is. In your uh, report, in this uh, handout you gave on page four, you get the eliminated, the survived, and the new. So it says standards must be aligned with credit bearing courses mm -hmm. in college. And then it says on the next page, under the ESSA, that this, the state uh, has that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Is that not correct? Yeah. So oh. am I correct in stating that as we go through the process for standards, for state standards, uh, we've only gone to step one, we haven't gone to step two yet, but when step three happens and we have a record for state standards. Our state has the authority to do that. Yes, I mean, they, and then you must, um, and here's where we get a, a little bit fuzzy, and I'll even go to my, my next slide on the limits of the secretary's authority, because the, um, the letter of the law is that states must provide an assurance that they've adopted challenging academic content standards, that they apply to all students, and that they must demonstrate that their standards are aligned with entrance requirements. Um, that means when you submit your plan to the department, when Dr. Verbeek did this, you're going to have to provide an assurance, sign something that says these standards meet these requirements of the law. Now, there's not going to be. I, miss, I hate to interrupt you, but maybe I misunderstand the process. The process was um, you would recommend to me in the process of our state standards at this point the commission sent to the state board their recommendations and the, the state board would send to the legislature here, so they would already be that not mm -hmm. correct you would not send me the state board would not send me um, unqualified standards it wouldn't be that i would have to do that accountability I would end up being the uh, one responsible, but you those um, meeting these assessment, I mean meeting these um, guidelines that you just stated would be um, everyone's objective: the state board of education and the legislature. So. Um, Let me ask a question too, since we're doing this, uh, maybe uh, off of Representative Horn's question. I think uh, Lee indicated earlier that one of the options states will now have is to use, uh, I think it was, a, maybe she called it alternative nationally on the test, and you said ACT or SAT. Mm -hmm. Can we theoretically give our school districts across the state the choice of which of those tests they might prefer to use or in order to meet the requirement, for, I think you said for everybody, do we have to pick one and say everybody will take this? If you want to give the other one in addition, you can, but you've got to give everybody either or. And Lee, I, well, you, I mean, whoever. I mean, I'll say the, the law, 
the law leaves it up to the state's discretion if, if they want to if they want to make this option available to districts and my understanding is that it could be under the law it could be multiple different nationally recognized assessments as long as they meet all those requirements of comparability and alignment and, and, and I'll say as an organization we have concerns there about but alignment so it'd be sort of up to the state if they could say we want everybody to take the same thing so we can compare one district with the other and we don't want to have some schools doing one thing and some doing the other uh, or we could say we like giving them the option and letting them choose and we'll see where this leads us. Okay. Lou? Uh, and this, Lou Fabrizio is in the Department of Public Instruction and he's sort of, I think, their point man on dealing with these new changes. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Chairman Blackwell and members of the committee. Um, you know, right now, the General Assembly passed a law that requires all 11th graders to take the ACT. So that's now currently existing. And one of the things that we are envisioning is that when we move to developing our state plan, we want to try our best to work with the General Assembly to see if we can come up with something very coordinated so we don't have certain things that are required because the General Assembly or the State Board requires it, and then other things we're doing because the federal government requires it. We want to try to have a very coordinated effort. So on the issue of local school districts administering something different, the law says that they, they can't on their own make that kind of a decision. There would have to be some approval process, which we envision would be the State Board, where we'd have to then undergo looking at the standards, looking at comparability issues, and then if it is decided that that test could be used, then that would then become an option that any school in the state could choose to use. Um, so again, this is a, a perfect example of some flexibility. But every time you do something like that, you lose something. Um, but that's all part of what we hope to be working out and ironing out over the next uh, six to eight months, or six months to a year, or however long it takes. Back to you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and I can, I can wrap it up pretty quickly. I mean, um, on some of these, to add a layer of complexity on everything here, um, and I, I, I think uh, like we needed that, um, is new limitations on the Secretary's authority. Lee touched on this a little bit, but one thing that makes all these questions um, a little unclear in terms of uh, uh, in terms of a state's flexibility, A, and B, in terms of a, um, how much the department will or will not regulate and how rigorous and strict they'll be on regulations has to do with this issue of the limitations on the, on the Secretary. Um, this law has really unpressed the Congress um, placed unprecedented limits on the secretary's authority under this law. You know, for example, <coughs> these are things you just don't often see in a law from a Congress to a head of a department, which is, um, uh, we already talked about standards on rulemaking. The secretary may not promulgate any rule that would add new requirements to the law um, or that are inconsistent with or outside the scope of the law. Now, it's kind of a funny statement because generally regulations have to be within the scope of the law. Um, but it is all these reminders to the secretary, like watch out, we're watching, and they're still doing this. Senator Lamar Alexander is one of the main authors of this bill, is already planning six oversight hearings. He's very concerned that the department is gonna push um, and try to regulate more than he would like. Um, the secretary not, may not prescribe goals, specific assessments, indicators, minimum and requirements, specific school and support. Um, Again, that seems very clear on its face. It seems like the secretary can't do anything. But if you look at it from a bit of a, a, a lawyerly or legislative lens, well, prescribe really means you can't tell me what my goals will be. But maybe the department can put some parameters around what your goal could be, or maybe some parameters around your indicators, but not tell you what the indicators are. And I, this is one where I'm just flagging an issue. This is completely a question mark on where the, the department's authority is gonna end up and People talk about lawsuits. It's, it's, there could be lawsuits if they try to go too far. Um, it's a very, um, 
uh, interesting uh, thing to, to watch in the future. Um, <coughs> you know, I want to um, close with this slide. This slide also <coughs> relates to the three-page handout I gave you, which will give you more detail on each of these topics. And I'm um, not going to run through all ten, but I wanted to you know, take the opportunity to give some, some as asked, some insights on, on where North Carolina can be most aggressive now that the ball is in the state's court, where can they be aggressive on, on making known decisions and taking advantage of some uh, opportunities? Um, I, I think uh, three final points. One, generally, um, a state, a state like North Carolina, should weigh in on rulemaking. You know, either as a legislature, as a department. The Department of Ed the U.S. Department of Education is desperate to hear from states because they, they want to do the right thing here and they don't want to put in place a regulation that's going to tie the state's hands, you know, three or four years down the road. Um, you know, that, that can be through the full, formal rulemaking process this summer or it can be through uh, more informal but on the record calls to the department. That they're, they're eager to hear from you. Um, uh, the, the second piece of information is um, more on uh, some advice around how North Carolina can take advantage of the things in the law and the, their new authority. Um, the few, <coughs> few uh, areas I think of particular interest to a state like North Carolina could be, um, this is a great opportunity to, to strengthen accountability. Um, uh, North Carolina will have to open up its grading system um, in order to comply with this law. It, it, it on its face probably would need to be changed. That's a huge opportunity to um, make it better, to maybe, as I heard earlier today, um, give a little more weight to growth. What are those ways that you want to, um, uh, uh, you know, or increase the emphasis on the lowest performing subgroups. Um, uh, you know, there another important thing. Start thinking about building a really powerful, we're calling them a turnaround toolbox. What are the things that the state wants to be able to do once it's identified those lowest performing schools? What are the tools they want to have in their toolbox? Is it, um, Attracting high-performing charters to a district? Is it new digital learning targeted at low-performing schools? Is it um, you know better better funding to attract um, more effective teachers? These are all things that will be up to the state to uh, identify, um, and you'll have federal funds and flexibility with it to, to do that. Um, huge opportunity to improve assessments. We I, I won't get back into this. Is clearly a huge issue for North Carolina, but there's a ton of flexibility. Um, not a ton. There's some new flexibilities that should be explored around assessments, um, and uh, we can. Uh, there's also a great opportunity to. There's funny to audit assessments to make sure what you do have is as streamlined and, and as high quality as it, as it can be. Um, on the innovation side of things, um, great opportunity for competency-based education. Uh, there's a pilot that the department can run. Seven states can apply to um, experiment with different ways of assessing and holding kids accountable um, in ways that um, move more towards the um, competency-based focus of, of, of education. Um, another opportunity is around um, course access and online learning. Um, course access, for those of you who don't know, is a um, it's like school choice, but it's course, course by course. Um, there are a number of states that are um, developing these technology-driven programs that give K-12 students um, access to quality courses no matter where they are. Um, so the way uh, North Carolina Virtual School does, now there's, um, in other states, there are um, huge opportunities for kids to have access to all the quality courses no matter where they are through online. Um, and there are, that's an important opportunity here because there are um, interesting new Flexible, uh, flexibility with federal funds. States can use federal funds now to support some of these programs in ways they couldn't before. Um, before we get too excited about all the opportunities, I want to talk about some risks too that, that we foresee coming down the pike um, related to this, this challenging transition. Um, there's no reason to think the anti-assessment backlash is going to go away. Um, may get worse during this transition. Um, you know, in, in North Carolina and other states, the the push um, the push 
against any kind of assessment is likely to grow into something that legislatures and the department should be aware of and prepared for and able to handle thoughtfully. Um, we, we anticipate that given the flexibility in the law, opponents of accountability will see this as a great opportunity to water down accountability. Make the goals really, really long. Make the accountability, make the indicators really fuzzy, or make the indexes so complex they don't mean anything. So um, that, that's something to be aware of um, as you think about renewing your assessment system, uh, your accountability system. Um, a couple more things, just the, the political capital issue. Um, in the past, a lot of the, the federal government provided some of the backstop on some of these issues around accountability assessments, and that's now gone, which is a great thing in a lot of ways, but it also means that some of the reform community is gonna have to fight battles at the state level that they used to just be able to say, it's required, um, and now you're gonna have to fight them state by state. Um, and, I, and I think there's a, um, North Carolina has been a, a fantastic um, Department of Education, uh, but even in, and some states aren't so fortunate, we're, 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 we anticipate a, a capacity issue in state departments of education that aren't um, prepared to handle some of the new authority. Um, I think North Carolina is well suited there, but it's a, it's a huge amount of um, power, decision making coming their way, um, and some just don't have the, the numbers and the experience um, that, that it might take to do it successfully. This, the, I included some slides that just, we have a master PowerPoint I can share with all of you, but these are just on, we pull out specific issues and talk about how the, the bill relates to them. Um, don't need to address them here. Um, we, you know, we encourage, um, we really encourage states to take this opportunity and, 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 and take it seriously. There, there are plenty of deadlines coming, but I think right now I should be focusing more on, on the larger vision here, and where, where you want to head and what your priorities are. Um, and, and how this new law can help you all get there. As an organization, we, our main goal is going to be to help states and legislatures do this. So, you know, we hope we can work with you all as well. We have in the past. Thanks so much.